Tonight's top stories. New terror arrest here in the U.S. The American Taliban gets 20 years. The Maryland sniper may have struck again. Plus, hard times for the unemployed. It's taking longer and longer to find a new job. Our regular Friday consumer alert. Beware of con artists who claim they can get you out of debt. And the people side of Hurricane Lily. The storm showed this man no mercy, robbing him of all he had. This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. Good evening. The campaign to crush al-Qaeda yielded four new suspects today, and once again, they are Americans. Two more from the same group are being sought. It was part of what Attorney General John Ashcroft called a, quote, defining day in the war on terror, a day that also included the sentencing of American Taliban John Walker Lind and the in-court confession of shoe bomber Richard Reed. CBS's coverage begins in Washington. Jim Stewart has details of today's arrests. The latest suspects are what appear to be terrorist wannabes as opposed to full-fledged al-Qaeda members. Federal and local agents in Portland and Detroit picked up four of the cell members while two others remain on the loose. Five of the six are U.S. citizens and one, this man, is a former U.S. Army reservist. Attorney General John Ashcroft said the cell began forming plans to go to Afghanistan and help al-Qaeda not long after 9-11. The indictment charges that the five defendants purchased airline tickets to Hong Kong with the intent of traveling to Taliban-controlled Afghanistan via China and Pakistan. Their goal was to join forces with al-Qaeda and the Taliban and fight against the U.S., but their timing was off. The cell members began buying airline tickets for the long trip the same week the U.S. began its bombing campaign in Afghanistan. The result was a frustrating journey. The men left Portland and flew to Hong Kong before traveling to Beijing. Unable to cross the border there into Afghanistan, they tried to gain entry through both Indonesia and Bangladesh before finally giving up and returning to Portland. U.S. officials wouldn't guess as to the motive and say there's no indication any of the four suspects in custody ever succeeded in making contact with al-Qaeda. Also, like the six Buffalo area men recently charged with aiding al-Qaeda, officials say they can find no evidence the Portland cell had picked a target or had any ongoing terrorist plans. Several of the suspects reportedly lived in this Portland apartment complex, and investigators say they were first tipped off to the cell when they began training with shotguns and small arms at a quarry. It started as a routine call. Uh, he, uh, a neighbor had heard noise of gunfire. A deputy was dispatched uh, by himself, uh, then encountered these individuals. What really sticks out about these arrests is the same thing that stuck out in the Buffalo case, that once again, the suspects aren't foreign-born agents, but homegrown Americans. Dan? Jim Stewart reporting live from Washington. As Jim just reported, three of today's terror arrests were in Oregon, and as CBS's Bill Whitaker now reports, they were not the first in that state, and they may not be the last. At dawn, 100 agents with arrest warrants swarm this South Portland apartment complex, picking up Jeffrey Battle and his ex-wife, October Lewis. Patrice Ford was arrested elsewhere. All the police activity uh, surprised yeah, neighbors. Got a knock on the door at 7 o'clock this morning, and it was the FBI. Had no idea what was going on. The last thing I'm worried about is whether or not I have terrorists that live in my house or in my neighborhood. Surprised, too, at the Rieswan Mosque, a block away, where the mosque president says he has never heard of these people. Absolutely not. Nobody from these apartments comes to this mosque. Investigators have been looking for, and they say finding, terror connections in Oregon for months now. For instance, James Ujama is facing trial in Washington state for allegedly trying to set up an al-Qaeda training camp in Bly, Oregon. And an unindicted co-conspirator in today's Portland case is U.S. citizen Ali Khaled Statia. He was sentenced to prison in Portland two weeks ago on unrelated gun and immigration charges. The leader of his mosque, Sheikh Mohammed Karia, goes on trial next month in Portland on social security fraud charges. Officials say the joint task force may not be done yet in Oregon. Investigation is continuing by the JTTF here at Portland pertaining to other individuals who also may have traveled from Oregon after September 11th. The three are being arraigned in this courthouse right now. If they are ultimately convicted of all charges, 
they could face sentences ranging from 20 years to life. Dan? Live from Portland, Oregon, Bill Whitaker. While that investigation is just beginning, the case of John Walker Lynn reached a climax today. Lind, a 21-year-old Californian, was a Taliban foot soldier captured in Afghanistan last November. Today, in a federal court in Virginia, Lind got a chance to speak. But as CBS's Bob Orr reports, the judge had the final word. Clean-shaven in a green prison jumpsuit, the so-called American Taliban John Walker Lind offered a tearful apology, expressing, quote, my remorse for what's happened. Lind told his sentencing judge, I made a mistake by joining the Taliban. With his family sitting behind him and crying at times, Lind read a 12-minute statement punctuated by emotional pauses. I did not go to fight against America, and I never did, he said. I have never supported terrorism in any form and never would. It was a far different Lind from the filthy, shaggy-haired man captured in Afghanistan 10 months ago. At the time, he refused to answer questions about his involvement with the Taliban and al-Qaeda. But in court today, Lind tried to make amends. I understand why so many Americans were angry when I was first discovered in Afghanistan, Lynn said. And he condemned Osama bin Laden for the 9-11 attacks, saying his grievances, whatever they may be, cannot be justified by acts of injustice and violence against innocent people in America. Prosecutors dropped the most serious charges against Lind when he pleaded guilty to aiding the Taliban and promised to tell all he knows about al-Qaeda. I'd characterize his... Um assistance as productive at this point, and, uh, and it's ongoing, and I'll leave it at that. Lind was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but that wasn't enough for the father of Mike Spann, a CIA operative who was killed in a prison revolt shortly after questioning Lind in Afghanistan. Allowed to address the court, Johnny Spann said the sentence doesn't fit the crime. Lind asked to be imprisoned in California to be near his family, but the judge cautioned that may not be possible if special security is required to protect Lynn from his fellow prisoners. Bob or CBS News, Washington. Unlike Lynn, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, was smiling and defiant as he confessed today to a federal judge in Boston. Reed, a British convert to Islam, pleaded guilty to trying to blow up an American Airlines jetliner over the Atlantic last December. He declared himself a follower of Osama bin Laden and, quote, an enemy of your country. Reed will be sentenced in January. In and around Washington, D.C. tonight, federal, state, and local authorities are pressing their hunt for whoever ambushed and killed at least five people and possibly more since Wednesday evening. Maryland investigators say it may be the work of a team, a sharpshooter, and a getaway driver. CBS's Joey Chen in Maryland has the latest. Joey? Dan fears that the killing spree is not over are underscored by two more shootings that police are now looking into. Now, late this afternoon, a woman was shot and wounded at a suburban shopping mall about 60 miles southwest of Montgomery County. It is the second incident at a Michael's Craft store. Police are also looking into last night's shooting death of an elderly man just across the border in Washington. And there are other reasons for the anxiety here as well. A particular weapon could be used for target shooting, possibly hunting. Investigators today brought out an array of high-powered weapons to demonstrate the type of firearm which might have been used. Any of these rifles, or dozens more like them, could have fired the 223 caliber rounds. Ballistic tests will reveal exactly what kind it was. But police are fairly certain that the shooter is a well-trained marksman who gunned down his victims from a distance. The closer you are, the less expertise you would need. The further away you are, the more expertise it would probably take. So far, the big break hasn't come. SWAT teams returned to some areas near the crime scenes today and again search vehicles that fit the only vague description they have. Investigators have called in a psychological profile expert to help understand the killer's motive and a geographical profiler to spot anything in the location of the shooting scattered over a four-mile radius that may yield some clue. Is there a pattern? Uh, is there something trying to be accomplished from, from the way it looks on the map? Are they familiar with the area? Are they simply just doing this in a, in a random fashion? And there are other unanswered questions as well, including when did the killing spree really begin? Police are now looking into records over the last several weeks to find out if there are any other cases that might be linked to what happened here. Dan? Joey Chen live in Rockville, Maryland. Turning to Iraq and the possible road to a new war, 
A new U.S. intelligence report says Saddam Hussein already has chemical and biological weapons and will have nuclear weapons in a few years. The chief United Nations arms inspector said tonight he's nearly ready to resume hunting in Iraq for such weapons, and he now agrees to the U.S. insistence that the U.N. Security Council pass a new resolution threatening war unless Saddam cooperates fully. President Bush, it was announced today, will deliver a major address about Iraq Monday night. Coming up next tonight on the CBS Evening News, Eye on America. How long does it take to find a job in this tough market? Ask him. Later, they were promised relief from their debts. What happened next is tonight's consumer alert. On the CBS Market Watch, a Friday sell-off on Wall Street. The Dow lost nearly 200 points. The Nasdaq, 25. It's now six losing weeks in a row. The market was not impressed by a report showing unemployment fell in September to a seven-month low. Here's the troubling number. The economy lost 43,000 more jobs than it created. And therein lies the problem for many workers. While the unemployment rate is still relatively low, good jobs are disappearing and they're not being replaced. So the search for a new job is taking longer and longer, as Anthony Mason reports in tonight's Eye on America. Every rush hour in Charlotte, North Carolina, Larry English walks the curb in a crisp suit with a neat sign, a human want ad along the highway. How long have you been out of a job? Well, the 15th of this month, it'll be exactly a year. A year? Mm-hmm. The 60-year-old English is no nut. He's a laid-off former branch manager for a computer services company. I'm not ashamed of what I'm doing. Do you worry that people would think you were a little kooky? Yeah, that's one of the risks I had to take. <laughs> but you were ready to try anything. Hey, you got to be creative. Think outside the box. Yeah. Because the slowdown has been tough on North Carolina. The furniture industry, for example, which employed 69,000 workers in the state a year ago, is down to 64,000. For the textile business, it's been even tougher. When business is good, are there all these machines running? Uh, they would all be running, yes. Charles Saunders has 45 employees at his thread company in Gastonia, but he's laid off 10 workers in the past two years. So when someone comes to you looking for work now, what do you tell them? Uh, we tell them we're not hiring. Saunders says more and more manufacturing jobs are being moved to Asia, and job retraining won't help many American workers. So where will they go? I mean, you can train someone to be a computer operator, but unless they have a computer to operate, it doesn't do them any good. And with unemployment in North Carolina soaring well above the national average, many here have had to make a job out of finding a job. Ready, ready, ready. Let's go. This group of laid off Charlotte workers has formed North Carolina job seekers. Take the whole box. Twice a week, they pile into a minivan. We have a map of all the business parks of the county. To attack office parks with a stack of resumes from their more than 30 members. We're not a recruiting service. But it's been hard. Our complete resumes. So every time we go into a business, they're telling us we just downsized. North Carolina job seekers. Does it matter what your education or experience is right now from what you can see? No. It's just you know, the job market is, is sort of like the weather here. and dry. You know, the drought here in North Carolina, it's dried up. And for more and more workers, like Larry English, that drought is lasting a long time. I'm looking for a position. I don't have a position. In this economy, a lonely foot soldier on the job front can find solidarity. Hope things work out for you, man. Well, thank you very much. What he can't find is a job. In Charlotte, North Carolina, I'm Anthony Mason for Eye on America. A state court jury in Los Angeles today ordered the Philip Morris Company to pay a record $28 billion, that's billion with a B, in punitive damages to a former smoker. Betty Bullock, now 64, has lung cancer and she sued the tobacco company for fraud and negligence. Philip Morris will appeal. Next on the CBS Evening News, consumer alert on credit card debt relief. Did Briggs and Baker con Mark and Tammy? and maybe many more. A meat recall was expanded today. It began after a recent E. coli food poisoning outbreak in the Midwest that sickened dozens of people. The suspect meat, about three million pounds, came from a packer for Cargo, a food industry giant. The latest recalls involve meat sold at A&P-owned supermarkets in 12 states. 
ANP says it's just a precaution. Like many other Americans, maybe you have bills and debts that are way overdue. Perhaps you're considering debt settlement. Before you sign up, watch out and watch this. It's CBS's regular Friday Consumer Alert, reported by CBS's Jerry Bowen. The ads are everywhere by debt negotiation companies, promising a cheap, fast escape from credit card bills. Briggs and Baker got me out of my debt for pennies on the dollar. That's why Mark and Tammy Garrison signed up with California-based Briggs and Baker. The promise, they say, that their $18,000 debt would be settled for 15 cents on the dollar and settled fast. Fine, huh? It was supposed to be done within 30 days. The Garrisons paid nearly $3,700 up front, stopped paying their credit card bills on Briggs & Baker's the orders, process. and then watched their world fall apart. We were getting creditors calling us every day. The Garrisons learned that Briggs & Baker hadn't paid the credit card companies, hadn't even contacted them, and the no-risk money-back guarantee wasn't. When you went and asked for your money back, what'd they say? They said no. I characterize it as a scam. It's, uh, I don't know of any other way that that you could possibly characterize it. The Better Business Bureau has rated Briggs & Baker as unsatisfactory after receiving more than 200 complaints from people who claim they didn't get what they were promised. The net effect is, is that people wind up uh, with their wallets lightened and their credit ruined. Company founder Todd Baker contends he's the real victim. This has been an engineered attack on this company by insiders and competitors. Disgruntled ex-employees, Baker says, are citing debt elimination programs the company no longer uses. And his attorney claims the number of complaints is exaggerated. We don't have hundreds of complaints in-house. I can assure you of that. You know why? I don't know why. Because people say they can't get you to answer the phone here. One former employee says the firm deliberately misled clients, a claim the company denies. Daniel Owen says he was about to blow the whistle when he was fired. Terminated, says the company, for disruptive behavior. What we were selling the clients, the product, the, the offers of getting them out of debt and putting them to financial freedom, it, it wasn't happening. California's issued a consumer warning on the company and ordered the firm to cease operating, an order the firm is appealing. Meanwhile, there's a class action lawsuit and a series of suits in small claims court by people who want their money back. I do award a judgment uh, to the plaintiff. The Garrisons won their case too, but the company's appealing and the nightmare is far from over. The couple filed for bankruptcy to escape the creditors they thought would vanish for pennies on the dollar. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Lancaster, California. You're watching the CBS Evening News and up next, the heartbreak of the hurricane. They escaped with their lives and little else, but many think they were lucky at that. What was Hurricane Lily spun off a tornado in Alabama this morning, brought wind and rain to Tennessee, and then kept heading north and east. For Gulf Coast residents in Louisiana, this was the day after the especially strange and unpredictable storm, a cleanup day from the hurricane's sea surge, flood and mud, and waiting for the power to be restored to hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses. But there were few injuries and no deaths in the U.S. CBS's Byron Pitts reports on luck and muck in the lowlands of Louisiana. Clean up on the Louisiana coastline, where by history's high standard, Hurricane Lily was a lightweight. It makes you want to cry when you, your four-year-old goes up to your mom and her mom and says, Mama, why are you crying? Unless, of course, your last name's Williams and you live on Abshire Road in a small town called Mo. This was my living room. Uh, there, there was a, the wall here, there was a big window, and that's where the door was. Lieutenant Jim Williams, married, father of three, a National Guardsman assigned to rescue victims of Hurricane Lily. He returned home this morning only to discover he was a victim, his home gone. Have you had a moment yet to think uh, what might have been if you all had been home? Just looking at it, I know we'd they'd be, I'd be at the hospital or at the uh, morgue right now, one or the other. For now, Lieutenant Williams' wife and children are staying with relatives. He's back helping other Louisiana families because that is his duty. To the nation, Lily may have been minor, but not to a man who lost everything he owned. I have faith. That's just all it is. I can't, I can't attribute it to anything else. It's just saying, all right, he's not going to give you anything you can't handle, so... You know, I just wish he didn't trust me so much, you know. 
Tonight, like so many others here, Jim Williams is leaning on his faith and his family because that's all he has left. Byron Pitts, CBS News, Mo, Louisiana. Part of our world tonight, Bob Schieff will be along Sunday morning with Face the Nation. Later tonight, 48 Hours Investigates. We've uncovered new evidence and new leads in the John Bonet Ramsey murder case and the never before seen police interrogation of her parents. It could change your mind. Tonight, 48 Hours Investigates. For the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting from New York. We invite you to join us again Monday. Good night. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com. AOL keyword CBS News. This is CBS.